Right, so let's have a little look at hovering. Otherwise this helicopter will run out of fuel, we'll just be sitting on the ground. So I'm just going to take off and move it over onto the grass. When you're hovering, whoop, badly, until I haven't played this thing today. So when you're hovering, you really don't need um, any of the flight instruments. The only one you would use in the real world would be whatever your power gauge is. So in a Robinson, that would be uh, your manifold pressure. Um, in a turbine, typically it's your torque gauge. Very occasionally it might be temperature or RPM, but more often than not, it's just torque. Now there's two kinds of hovering. There's what's called in-ground effect and out-of-ground effect. In-ground effect is when you're close enough to the ground to build up a cushion beneath you. And in-ground effect hovering requires less power. Out-of-ground effect hovering, um, you don't have that cushion beneath you. And the crossover point is typically about one and a half times the rotor diameter. So a jet ranger's got about, yeah, so a jet ranger's got about, I hear the dogs in the background, got about a 35 foot roast diameter. So about 50 foot up, um, you'll run out of ground effect. And if you don't increase power, typically you'll just stop going up. So I'm trying to demonstrate there, but not very well. So the effects of the controls in the hover You've got pitch and roll with the cyclic, you've got yaw with the pedals, and you've obviously got height up and down by adjusting your collective. The aim of hovering, depends on the aircraft, yeah it could be more than 50 feet, you can have, um, if you have something like a Chinook, you might be 100 feet still being ground effect. Um, the ground effect is also dependent on the surface that you're hovering over. If you're hovering over a smooth tarmac, you'll get a really good ground effect. If you're hovering over long grass or water, the water or the grass will take all the energy out of your downwash and eliminate a lot of the ground effect. So what we're trying to do when we're hovering is keep the aircraft over the same position on the ground, pointing in the same direction. It's perfectly all right to move the controls and you'll need to make lots of small adjustments to the controls the aircraft will pitch and roll a little bit, go up and down a little bit, that's absolutely fine. All we're trying to do is keep the thing over the same spot. Now I'm using a joystick that's sprung loaded, which is a bit of a pain, because if I let go of the joystick, the aircraft will just go all over the shop. So I have to keep a constant bit of pressure on. More for yaw than anything else. One of the common mistakes that everybody does, whether it's a flight simulator or whether it's real world stuff, um, is over controlling. So what we want to be trying to do is looking about mid distance. You don't want to look close to the aircraft. You don't want to look miles away. You want to look mid distance. So about sort of the fence that's in front of us here. So that you've got the near ground in your peripheral vision. Because it's your peripheral vision that picks up movement and the sooner you pick up the movement of the aircraft, the sooner you can make adjustments. And if you pick it up straight away, you can make small adjustments with the controls. If you pick it up late, you have to make bigger corrections with the controls. And the bigger input you make, the more the aircraft moves, and the harder it is. So if I deliberately start over controlling, you end up having to make bigger and bigger movements to try and correct what the aircraft is doing. Because all you really want to do is just look out to your reference point and fight to keep it in the same spot. And it just takes practice, lots and lots of practice. The other thing that can happen when you're hovering is something called cross-controlling. So cross-controlling is when you see the, there goes the dog again, it's when you see the aircraft doing something, 
it's pretty good actually um, especially with the bouncing up and down the flight model is pretty good I flew the um, the 76 which is the one that comes with X-Plane 11 um, and I wasn't impressed it wasn't that good but I forget who made this one it's on the X-Plane forum um, it's very good so cross controlling is when you see the aircraft do something but you misinterpret what the aircraft is doing and use the wrong control. So an example would be the nose yours to the right. So instead of putting in left pedal, we put in left cyclic and roll the aircraft instead, which is really common. New students do it all the time. So the way to try and stop that from happening is to have a reference point out the front of you. So if we use that single tree in the field as a reference point, if that moves left or right, we know we've got to use the pedals to correct its position. If the horizon in the distance moves, we know it's cyclic. And if our tree goes up or down, we know it's cyclic again and it's pitch. So as long as you've got a couple of good reference points, you can keep the aircraft more or less where you want to try and keep it. Now I'm going to take it slightly out of sequence on the lessons and the next thing I want to look at is landing. Because landing a helicopter is basically hovering downwards until you make contact with the ground. And if you want to make a nice landing, it starts from a nice hover. If we keep the aircraft in as smooth a hover as I can manage, I could try. This is where the hovering goes to pieces. Yeah, so the tree, just out the front. So if we look at your on the pedals, left and right, roll, I'll manage, don't panic, left roll, sideways, right roll, it's a lot trickier because I'm looking at the helicopter moving, Whereas what I want to be doing is looking at the helicopter moving in relation to reference points. There we go. So back inside again with the reference points, it's easier to line things up. You'd probably find model aircraft flyers would be very, very good at flying it from the outside and not so good from the inside. But the landing say so it's just a hover where you go down maintaining a smooth hover and when you stop going down in theory you're on the ground now taking off we look at that from outside that's probably a bit easier when you're taking off you're going to have to overcome the secondary effects of all the controls before the helicopter leaves the ground. This might result in a crash, but we'll see what happens. If I just increase power to take off, what we should get is a load of yaw. Yeah, there we go. Let's see if I can go around in a complete circle without rolling over. That's just the torque from the engine going through the main rotors rotating the aircraft so you increase power gently as soon as you see the aircraft start to yaw apply a bit of pedal now by putting the pedal in we should now get a bit of sideways momentum because the tail rotor is pushing from left to right there we go a little bit of sideways so to correct that a little bit of left cyclic we try and hover before we leave the ground. So 
so that when we do leave the ground, we are relatively stable. So if we can pull it down again in third person. Probably not. We'll give it a go. Oh, that was better than the other one. One of the risks we're taking off, if you haven't got the aircraft effectively hovering before it leaves the ground, um, you can get into a condition called dynamic rollover. And that's when a skid will catch on something on the ground and the aircraft will just pivot around the skid and roll over. I'll see if I can simulate that without actually doing it. There we go. And it's rolled over. Perfect. Right, so we've got ourselves an R44. How horrendous is that? Let's see what this thing flies like while we're at it. So that was the risk of hovering with dynamic rollover. Oh, well, that's a good start. It flies a lot like a Jet Ranger, which the real ones do. That's pretty good. Yeah, so that dynamic rollover is when you've got the aircraft still on the ground, but wanting to travel sideways. And a skid contacts something solid, so the aircraft can't slide. <laughs> yes, they are. I've got about 3,000 hours in 22s and 44s. Um, they're not the nicest helicopter in the world. So the secret to avoiding dynamic rollover or any other ho hover taking off related issues is just to make sure the aircraft is not wanting to yaw, it's not wanting to pitch or roll before you apply enough power for the aircraft to leave the ground. Just looking at the manifold pressure. Yeah, it's not that realistic. <laughs> it wasn't your fault. Oh, you mean about calling them hideous? No, they are hideous. Robinsons are hideous. The reason they are so popular is because they're so cheap. If you think you buy a brand new R44 for whatever it is now, 350 grand, something like that, sterling. The next helicopter up, something like a Jet Ranger X, you know, you're looking at a million pounds. And that's the sole reason Robinsons are popular, because they're cheap. And also piston engines, a brand new engine for an R44, 25 grand. Brand new engine for a Jet Ranger, quarter of a million quid. So there's a huge difference in running costs, and you get what you pay for. Um, if this was a real R44, I'd expect to be pulling about 20 inches of manifold pressure, bottom right end gauge, um, to hover, even if I was just on my own. So that's not amazingly accurate but the flight model is quite accurate seems to be quite nice um, so moving on from hovering the next thing we want to look at is spot turns now let's assume for a second I don't think there's any wind in this at the minute but say we had a 10 knot wind on the nose and we're hovering into wind that means although we're not moving over the ground the helicopter does actually have an airspeed of 10 knots so the helicopter is flying forwards even though we're not moving. So if we make a turn to the left, and you always start spot learning to do spot turns to the left, if we did nothing else, we'd have an attitude for 10 knots of forward speed, and the wind would now blow us to the left at a speed of 10 knots, because that's the wind speed. So what we need to do to stop that from happening if I put us back into wind, our imaginary wind. So if we're sitting into a 10 knot wind, facing into the wind, if we do 90 degrees to the left, what we have to do is raise the nose to stop from going forwards and roll the aircraft slightly into wind. So effectively what we have now is a helicopter that's flying sideways to the right at 10 knots but not moving over the ground. Same thing happens if we do another 90 degrees what we now need to do is stop flying the aircraft to the right 
and try and fly the aircraft backwards at a speed of 10 knots and if we keep the turn going as we go 90 degrees more to the left we now need to stop flying backwards and start flying to the left so that we're still flying into wind and if we complete the turn all the way around we now need to get the aircraft flying forwards again at about 10 knots the simplest way to do that in both the simulator and the real world is to do it slowly do it slowly look out the window constantly retrim with the cyclic remembering that the pedals are what's turning us on the spot the cyclic is keeping our position on the ground and just keep going around really slowly don't look at the instruments just look out the window react to what the aircraft wants to do with a bit of practice you'll be able to go all the way around having a good clearing turn staying roughly on the spot and not going up or down too much he says now the reason we start off with a left one and not a right one the tail rotor is pushing against the torque and whenever you put in left pedal and you all the aircraft left you're pushing it round with the tail rotor whenever you go around to the right what you're actually doing is not putting in right pedal but taking out the left pedal and allowing the torque to turn the aircraft to the right which is just slightly less stable as clearly, clearly demonstrated than going around to the left that's why when you practice spot turns practice to start with with left hand ones unless you're flying a helicopter with the blades go around the other way like a gazelle EC120 um, I think most of the Eurocopters go around the wrong way so once you've learned to hover on the spot and turn the aircraft around in circles you can then taxi around using a runways quite helpful uh, more so in the simulator world than the real world because it gives you nice straight lines to follow so the first thing you want to practice doing is just hovering in a straight line trying to keep the aircraft flying and pointing in the direction you want it to go you want to hover taxi at a, at a steady walking pace anything more than that and the aircraft might go into forward flight and then it will climb suddenly Using a runway is quite good because you can see straight away how far off the centre line you are and whether you're pointing the right way and whether like this you're making a complete pig's ear of it. That's all because I started going a little bit too quickly. we got down to the other end and we could try a little bit of sideways in the real world you need two reference points for going sideways you need one in front of you to keep the aircraft pointing where you want and you need one to the side of you to see where you're going turning your head in the flight simulator is really tricky this might actually be easier from the outside Or not. Whoa. Crashing coming. 
A hammerhead? Oh, you mean a talk turn? Yeah, we could do one of those. So for a talk turn, lots of airspeed. Pull up to near vertical. And as the airspeed bleeds off, it should yaw to the right, point itself back at the ground, and then you just fly away. So I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll have a look at uh, a takeoff transition, fly around the airfield and then uh, do an auto-rotation. Right, so the first thing we do before we do anything, get into the hover. And get ourselves stable in the hover before we start. He says. So if you're in a stable hover and you go to accelerate forwards, what should happen is the aircraft should sink towards the ground, which it does a little bit. The reason it does that, you've got all your thrust pointing downwards. You've got just enough to stop the aircraft from going up or down. So if you start using that for acceleration, the aircraft will sink. So when we start moving forwards, we apply a little bit more power, only a little bit, to stop the sink. The next thing that happens is something called translational lift and flat back, which if you do nothing, pitches the nose up and slows you down again. Now translational lift occurs when you get to about 12 to 18 knots, and it's when you get a change in airflow from above the rotor disc to in front of the rotor disc, which means you've got less of a vertical component, talking and flying at the same time, less of a vertical component of air, so the air is accelerated more for no increase in pitch or power, which gives you an increase in angle of attack, so you get more power without having to do anything. Flat back is due to a change in airspeed across the rotor blades. Let me put it on the ground for a second and I'll tell you what that means. So if... So the blades are going around counterclockwise like this. So when you're stationary both the blades are travelling at the same airspeed. As soon as you start moving forwards this blade here that's coming over the tail and going forwards has a higher airspeed than this one over here which is going backwards in relation to where the aircraft is going. So this one going forwards has more airspeed, this one coming backwards has less airspeed. So this one comes up, this one comes down, it reaches its highest point over the nose and has the effect of tilting the rotor disc backwards which is why the aircraft will then pitch up. So. To overcome all of those things in a normal transition, you just look out the window. You push the nose forward, increase power to stop the sink, keep looking out the window, keep pushing it forward when it wants to rise, there's the flat back, push it forwards, build the airspeed, as soon as you get your 40 knots, let the nose come up, and we climb away. Simple as that. As soon as we pass about 300 feet, you're looking out to the attitude, so that's the, air, that's the horizon in the distance, and in the case of the Robinson, that compass bracket. So you can find the right position for the horizon for 60 knots, so we climb at 60 knots. You would, in a real aircraft, be on about 25 inches of manifold pressure. We're on 15. So I'm not convinced this aircraft is, and we should be much slower than this. 
Normally in a 44, I'd enter auto rotation as the cowling just crossed that road for L Street. So let's kill it all the way down. And nothing's happening. If I cut the engine. In theory, this should auto rotate. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go out on a limb. I reckon it's not gonna auto rotate. Let's see what happens. There goes the engine RPM. Rotor RPM's coming down. Oh no it is, it is. It's it's auto rotating. Not very well, but it's auto rotating. I've gone way too fast to try and keep the RPM up. Let's see if we can flare out. It's climbing, it wouldn't climb. I'm now going to get a drop in RPM. That's all right. Right, we're going to try and kill the speed, keeping the aircraft at about 10 feet. Oh, come on. Yeah, we're losing all the RPM. How about that? 